Good morning, ladies, and welcome to this year's installment of Megillah's Esther. I cannot refrain from using the explanation given by the Vilna Gon. Well, it's half by the Vilna Gon and half by an ancestor of Rabbi Brevda, he should rest in peace. The ancestor had a sefer called Yosef Lekach, and he lived during the time of the Vilna Gon, and the Vilna Gon said it was a good perush. I happen to also know that I read somewhere that Rav Steinman's at Sal said that this was the best parish of Megillus Esther, and it's, and it's true. So we are going to open up Megillus Esther like never before. Um, those of you who have heard this before, I'm sure, are back because it's, it, it's so powerful and it changes your whole understanding of the Megillah, and the Megillah becomes alive to us. We'll hear the real story of Purim. According to the Yosef Lekach, which was agreed by the Vilna Gon, and then there's some parts where the Vilna Gon himself added certain things. So that's what we're going to be exploring today. Okay, let's first have some background historically to the Megillah and, and remember when it took place. The Megillah took place during the time when Yermio Hanavi predicted that for 70 years, uh, the, the, the base of Migdash, the temple, will be in ruins, and after 70 years, it will be rebuilt, okay? Now, these 70 years of exile become a bit of a conflict because um, we'll see shortly, that because, because basically, the, um, even Achashverosh made a mistake in the Megillah, according to some commentaries, he was wearing at his famous party, he was wearing the clothes of the Kohen Gadol which he had confiscated, and he put out some vessels from the base of Megdash, reason being he thought that the 70 years were over. That's what the word was that was out. But it wasn't so simple. You see, it was like this. There were actually two waves of exile. There was, well, first of all, there was the, the when Korish came to power, uh, I'm sorry, not Korish, Nebuchadnezzar came to power in Babylon, which is today Iraq. And interestingly enough, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the base of Migdash, there is till, I remember listening to the radio in those days, I listened to the radio. And when there was in, um, what was it, 92, when there was the whole thing with uh, the Iraqis and Kuwait and everything like that, I heard on the radio that they said that the elite four, of course, of the Iraqi army is called the Nebuchadnezzar Corps till today. Nebuchadnezzar is revered in Iraq, which was Bavl. A lot of our famous um, prophets are buried in Bavl. Yermio is buried there. And I believe Yechezkel is buried there. Um, and in Iran, we have Daniel the prophet and we have Esther and Mordechai that are buried in a city called Hamadan, Iran, because Iran is Persia. Now, out of those 70 years, 52 of the years were ruled by the Babylonians but the last 18 were from the Persians, okay? Now, the, um, the Jews also, it wasn't just one exile. It wasn't just one time. The Jews were about 15 years apart with two waves of exile. That's why there were two steps of Geula, so to speak, for the, in, the, in the Purim story. The first was called the Choreshu Masker. There was a group of Jews, it's the elite, the ones were Sanhedrin, or they were Kohanim, or they were famous people, you know, all those people were exiled first. And about 15 to 18 years later, the, the, it called, you know, there were the regular people that were exiled to Babylon. So we have to count 70 years from both. And there were steps that fulfilled that in, um, in the whole history. So we have the Harsh of Moscow. We have the, it, they're all exiled in Babylon. And then the, 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 um, well, let's talk a little bit first about, let's do it in order. Let's talk about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was like a Stalin. That's what he was. They say, the Gemara says during his day, nobody smiled. You can just imagine. I mean, we can feel it a little bit now with the war that's going on. We should hope that every year should stay safe in, in the Ukraine and beyond, wherever they go, their travels, they should be safe and healthy. Amen. And in any case, Nebuchadnezzar, was um, he was a despot and he had tremendous desire for power, a mass murderer. They said he was very short and very fat. They say he looked like a ball. That's how fat he was. Now, not only did no nobody smile, 
he had these different things when he would capture another world leader he would like them to be tortured in front of him that's the, this is the man we're speaking about and to, and it's not so unlikely these kind of people live today unfortunately because without the Masilis Yisharim, without Musser, and without working on your character, without the Torah, without fear of Hashem, anybody can become a horrible person if they don't keep themselves in check. So the, uh, what happened was, so he, he was murdered by people. Um, I mean, he, he, eventually he was murdered by others because you know a despot cannot last forever. And Nebuchadnezzar in his, the Babylonian empire, they ruled over 127 countries. Not only was he cruel to everybody in the world, his own son, Evel Morodach, he was constantly paranoia, had paranoia about his son. He put him in prison several times. And when Nebuchadnezzar um, was alive, there was actually one sin the Jews had committed, albeit out of tremendous pressure. And that, that sin was that Nebuchadnezzar made many statues of himself throughout the kingdom, and everybody had to bow to them. And one of them even, they say he put the Urim Batumim in the mouth of the statue to make it speak. And, um, and some Jews succumbed out of terror to bow down to the statue. When you know it's one of the mitzvahs, you're supposed to let yourself be killed rather than succumb to bowing down to a statue, an idol. So they did that out of fear. And it wasn't all the Jews, it was a certain percentage. But that was already uh, a stain on our, on our souls that got passed down and it had to have some type of rectification. Oh my goodness, let me just turn this down. Sorry about that. Um, now, the, um, so when, when he, so that was one thing that they did wrong, but, but uh, you know, now just like, it's similar to what they say about Masada. You know, a lot of people are under the notion, a lot of people did this great heroism in Masada by letting themselves be, you know, killing themselves rather than be killed by the, um, the Romans. It's not such a simple story, by the way, because uh, you're not supposed to kill yourself not to be conquered by somebody. There were 92 Jewish girls in uh, Poland that took cyanide rather than to be, um, uh, how do you put it? I don't know, in a nice way. They, they were, you know, the Nazis wanted these 92 Basiako girls to come to them privately. And they all took cyanide before they were, be, would be abused in that way. But that's different. Those are all mitzvahs where you're supposed to exploit it. Thank you, the great uh, author. Um, now, the, uh, we, rather than to be exploited, they, they, you know, they, they can kill themselves. This is a case where you can kill yourself. But the case of Masada is not a case. But the case here by Nebuchadnezzar, they should have avoided the, the idols or they shouldn't have bowed down whatsoever because even though everyone was absolutely terrified of him, it was in those days when there were still prophets alive and the Jews were on a very high level. There was a base of Migdash, violated, thank you, another author. Um, so th therefore, the, um, therefore they, had to, they had to allow themselves to be killed. This is the three cardinal commandments that you have to let yourself be killed rather than to violate. Now, when he finally died, his son Elvo Morodach was supposed to you know, rule over him. He did for a short while. He, he had to see his father's grave unearthed before he would believe it because they were, people didn't think he'd ever die. They were so in the horror of him. He wanted to see his father's body dead and only then would he come out of hiding. Now, eventually, um, Paras and Madai, the, the, the Persians and the Medes got together. They're the ones that conquered Babylon. And they took over all 127 of his countries. There's one other thing I forgot to mention. I'll mention it right now. Another thing that, that he had that was like an obsession is he had to have all the, the treasures of the world in this possession. When we mean treasures, you know, it could be sculpture, it could be jewelry, it could be art. I, I always equated something to like the Mona Lisa, you know, but um, whatever it was, like a national treasure, every country that he conquered, he had to have in possession all those artifacts. He wanted them. But then he became all paranoid about that. He didn't know, like, he's afraid someone's going to take them from him. He had a 1,080 artifacts. And he put them in a, he had slaves build for him 
uh, a, um, they had a canal not far from his palace. They built a copper ship because apparently copper does not float. And to, you know, to be ahead of the game and everything, he loaded all 1,000, it's all kind of to the Midrash and Vilna Gone, everything. He loaded 1,080 treasures into the boat and he had the boat, boat sank. And then he, well, first he let it out to, to see, you know, and the Euphrates, the Paras, the, the, the Nahar Paras, and he sunk the boat and no one could ever find it. He said he wanted to enjoy them. He looked at them all the time. He didn't want anyone else to enjoy them. This was the character of Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed our first base of Megdash. He also ate Averman Hachai, forgot to say that as well. That is, he used to take a rabbit and, you know, rip it limb from limb and eat it. And that's basically one of the reasons the temple was destroyed because the, he was bringing a korban or something and the, the Chachamim didn't want to accept it because they felt he was violating this Noahide commandment. Now, so the, the Persians and the Medes took over from him and they had several kings. The, the first king they had was Koresh. This was, this Koresh, now, by the way, except for Ahasuerus, all the Persian kings were basically providing a good environment for Jews. It was like America and Canada, where it was, you know, safe, basically, with, you know, they, they allowed the Jews to be kindly. And in fact, in our second base of Migdash, if you ever go to the Living Torah Museum in Borough Park, which is phenomenal, they have a whole model of the second base of Migdash. Um, and in that base of Migdash, in the entranceway, they had a sign in Persian, thanking the Persian government for providing them with the base of Migdash, well, helping them. So Koresh, the first king, he, he, um, he what's it called? He allowed amazing thing. All people were allowed to return from their countries. All Jews were allowed to come and return the base of Migdash. But there were a few problems that occurred with that. Problem number one was they saw in Babylon, one of the chief cities that he had conquered, that all of a sudden the whole business um, area was desolate. All the main business taking place in Babylon was no longer happening. And he inquired as to what was going on. And they said, well, the Jews were the masters of the business in Babylon. And now that they're gone, they all went to Israel to build the base of Megdash. Now, you know, there's no business, no commerce going on. So um, that bothered him. People told against the, Jew told against the Jews that he was a... Uh, you know, a rebel, that, that they were rebelling, that they were trying to have rebellion. So he, that was another thing that bothered him, that ticked him off. And eventually he rescinded his offer. So all they had built were the foundations of the base of Megdash and the Mizbeach. And all of a sudden they had to stop the building. Um, and another thing that was held against him was that he didn't lift a finger. He told everybody they could come, but he didn't support them in any way, shape or form. He just told them they could go, which was which good enough. Now, Hashem rewards any little thing done in this world. We believe that if somebody does a good turn to somebody, he is given something in this world. Like we find so many Nazis, look how many of them escaped to Paraguay or Argentina. I'm just trying to move this a little bit back. How many of them escaped to Paraguay or Argentina? And... Um, they, uh, they lived, you know, simple, uh, okay, their lives were, were not bad at all. How could that be? Such wicked people could live in such comfort. But we believe as Jews that, that a person, to be rewarded in this world, the currency of this world is temporary. The thing we're worrying about is to get the next world. And in fact, the people that have it too easy in this world, that means God says, okay, you've got it all for the next world. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I paid you already. I don't have to pay you again. So too, Koresh was paid for his good intentions that he did let them back and he did start doing things. So guess what? In his time, one time there were scuba divers uh, looking for certain treasures and they, in, they discovered the ship that was buried by Nebuchadnezzar and they unearthed the 1,080 treasures, which was amazing. Now, after Koresh, was for a year somebody called Daryavesh, the Mede, that was not the son of Esther. And after that, I'm sorry, after Kar, uh, yes. And then came um, Ahasuerus. 
Achishverosh, some people call him Xerxes the Eighth or Artach Shasta, they'd say in Aramaic or Persian rather, and he um, took over from him. Okay, so that's the background to, to all of that. Now, the Megill itself is a 12 year story. So that's why we have to hear every word. You know, it looks like we're goners in the beginning and all these different things, circumstances that keep changing at the end. Unbelievable how many miracles we had to go through in order to get to the point of where we are treated like, you know, like we're finally given freedom in the time of Ahasuerus. So it's very unusual in the Persian days that we had hardships, but the reign of Ahasuerus was, as soon as Haman comes on the scene, becomes very difficult for the Jews. Okay, now with that background, we are going to now open up our Megillas. I still have the one for Mrs. Shapiro. If she's on with us today, I don't know, but um, I really appreciate it and think of her every time I use it. And we have our Megillah Sester. If you open to Perak Aleph, Pasuk Aleph, we are not gonna go through every word because it would probably take us eight out, eight classes. We are going to cover enough where we're going to get some amazing ideas and you will get full of information in three hours. So let's take up some important phrases. In the first verse, and it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, by he be me Ahasuerus. Who Ahasuerus? That's the Ahasuerus that's, that's ruling from Ehodu Viad Kush, from India to Ethiopia, 127 countries. Now, the reason we're analyzing this first verse. First of all, Rashi always tells us Vayihi always means a time of trouble is coming. Uh, anytime it says that in Nach, in, in, in Prophets, but it says in the, why is Ahasuerus' name repeated twice? And also second question, it says Hamolech, that rules, it's present tense. Now we know he's not alive. We don't believe that, you know, people are coming back to be our Mashiach. And we don't believe that Ahasuerus is alive. He's not a Malach or anything of that sort. So what does it mean present tense he ruled? So we're told, this is, you probably heard this part before, that he was a stable boy for the Babylonians. Um, and he worked himself up. He married Vashti, who's the granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar. And how did he come to power where well, there were no heirs for Koresh? I think that, that Darius the Mede was one year or something. I think he was uh, Koresh's son. And then um, I think he was his son. I'm not sure. But then it was only one year and there was like a, a void. Ahasuerus, either he won the Powerball lottery. I don't know. Somehow he came to money, which was unusual for a stable boy. But he also had a gift of political gab. He knew how to influence people. Basically, you know, he talked, he worked his way up, he had dinner with this one and coffee with that one until he worked his way up and he became the king of 127 countries. Unbelievable. But it does show that he had some strengths. But the fact that Ahasuerus, who ruled, why does it ruled in present tense? He wasn't deserving of kingship. He really was, he was a commoner until those days. Uh, I mean, still till today, people are very much into, you know, people from certain families. You have to have a lot of money to become a, usually a, a ruler of a country or you have to have royal blood. He was an exception to the rule, but he did have money, obviously. Um, you know, and, and, and that's, what ha that's what happened. Now, but it says, He wasn't worthy of being the king, but somehow he procured a lot of money to influence people just like George Soros. And um, that's how he became, you know, had a lot of influence and power in the world. That's the way the world goes from then. It's not a new lesson. <laughs> it, that's how a lot of people had a lot of influence with these, uh, with their pocketbooks, which is why the world, the world is not ruled always so justly. Now he knew that there were and, and, and if we think we're so far from it, that's America. Money, you could get everything. In America with money, and money talks, same thing. So there's three things he felt that have to be done to secure the royal monarchy. How does he do that? Number one, he should marry into royalty. So he did. He takes Vashti as his wife, who was the granddaughter, we said, of Nebuchadnezzar, the daughter of Belshazzar. And uh, she was as evil as her ancestors. 
Also, he feels, you know, another thing you need, if you're running for office, you need photo ops. You need to be seen in front of, you know, Parliament Hill. You know, you need to be in the, all the right places, the right time. You're seen with the starving people that you help them and all this. His photo op was that he wanted to have a palace that was really worthy. And he wanted to have, in those days, the big deal was to have a throne, a fancy throne. And that showed you were like it. People see you, see you like that, it's, you know. <laughs> but um, Chazal say, Ein hamako mechabed es ha'adam, ha'adam mechabed es mekomo. We, we say that the place does not honor the person. The person honors the place. It's not the background behind you that's going to make you look like something, you know, what it's your, you know, what you've got in your home or what you've got in your possession or the kind of shalach manas you prepare, you know, even though some people enjoy doing something artistic or creative, all the power to them. And many people, you know, I enjoy doing it, but we can't be enslaved to wanting to copy what everybody thinks and, you know, to, you know, out of respect and everybody should think we did such a great job. Um, so he wanted these backdrops. He wanted the throne. He wanted the royal blood in the family. And he wanted to, you know, to look like he's, uh, like he's it. There was one problem, though, about the throne. He wanted the throne that resembled identically the throne of Sh Shlomo HaMelech. Now, Shlomo HaMelech had a very unusual, intricate, elaborate throne. It was made of gold. And they say Achashverosh's was made of silver, by the way. But there were all kinds of, in ancient times, what Shlomo did was incredible. They had like every step, it was a mechanical apparatus. Every step he took, something else would occur. Step he took up to the throne. So I, I think like at one point an eagle would meet him and then a bear would meet him. And at the end, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, not eagle. Eagle was the last thing. They had bears and lions and everything all made of gold that would like come to meet him as he would ascend the throne. And finally, at the end, an eagle would fly above him and put the crown on his head. That was incredible, you know, accomplishment by Shlomo Melech. Now, if you doubt this idea and you say, come on, in those days, they could make such things. First of all, imagine how did they build a base of Mikdash in royal times or even the time of Solomon with those huge bricks that we see at the Kosel. How did they put that together in ancient times? Unbelievable to even to move it from place to place must have been utterly incredible. Also, I happened to visit many, many years ago on a tour with the, the famous, wonderful tzaddik for Pesach Levi. He should be Gesundheit and Stark. And on that trip, he took us to a place called Megiddo. Megiddo is in Nazareth, which is Nazareth. And it was a famous city because it's near the port. And it's, um, it was very strategic. Shlomo Melech had his summer palace there. And we visited it and um, I'm sorry, it was not a port city, but it, they had to have a water source to get them to the port. That was the deal, I remember now. Anyways, that's the, 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 the fort was amazing to see, the whole palace structure. They had different things that were incredible. He thought of everything for self-protection. And one thing that really amazed me that I didn't forget was that there was a mountain, uh, Megiddo's on a mountain, I believe, and they found a source of water because it's important to have water in case they'd be uh, you know, enclosed for a while. Let's say somebody put a siege on them, they needed a source of water. So what they did was they, they dug and they found some source of water and they wanted to enclose it and put it like in a cave. So they fashioned this whole structure around the water source. And the structure was incredible that they had people chiseling, you know, um, one side would go like you either chisel up or you chisel down. These are ancient times, the way they had to do it with, you know, the, the tools. And they chiseled through the mountaintop. And what's incredible is at finally, when they made this ability to reach this water source, the two people that were, um, that were digging met each other in the middle, exactly in the middle. Now that's incredible if you think it's ancient times, how to meet exactly at the same spot to be able to dig out the same area. They say the English channel, which was built in the 20th century was off by 12 inches. The, um, you know, getting the two people coming from two different directions to dig, to meet each other didn't happen. But at the time of Shlomo Melech, it did. So that just tells us the incredible power that Shlomo Melech has. As an aside, 
I just wanted to say that um, we, you know, we often take pride in all our uh, technological advance, advances in our generation, but we have to know, it says in the Shemona Esrei, Ata chonein la'adam das, to give man wisdom. Umalameid la'enosh bina, and you teach humanity bina, you know, that's like a deeper understanding, intuition, under, deeper understanding. What does that mean? Shimon Schwab that Sal tells us, how do we understand that? He says bina means to understand something from something else. He said civilization in general cannot take credit for all their actions. Like a cell phone came from a phone, which came from electricity, which came from this, that, and the other. So nobody today could say, I created this great technology. You're standing on the shoulders of previous generations who contributed so much to society. And your contribution is albeit a big one, but it's because of other people that you've achieved so much. So that's umalame and no shbina, that society has learned. We've had the, 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 the fortune, Hashem gave us intuition to understand from something that already exists to add on to it and create more. Okay, so that's Pasuk Aleph, that he came to, he came to the throne. It was not coming to him. And look what he had, he had to do to acquire it. And it looks like that's the way to acquire it. But we Jews are not supposed to go running around to do things to please people. And it's not the place that honors us, but it's us that honors the place. We see our gedolim live in the simplest places, you know, barely a home. And yet they are the greatest people in the generation. Pasuk base. Kesheves ha-melech. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his throne that was in Shushan. Now, this is a very important verse. You think, what does it mean? Third year, sit on his throne in Shushan. It's big. This is what the Vilna Gaon tells us. <laughs> now, he wanted this throne to look the part, right? He already had Hillary, you know, or Hillary. He had his version of Bill Clinton. And, you know, now he had Vashti. And now to add on to it, he needed this throne. So now he's going to build this throne, which in those days was a huge undertaking. Not only did it have to be beautiful, but it had to work mechanically. So he wanted to hire the best people. Now, nobody wanted to do it because people were afraid if it doesn't please the king, no matter if they're going to spend three, four years on it, no matter what the pay would be, they're afraid, you know, they wouldn't be talking about it afterwards. Let's put it that way. They wouldn't be alive to speak about it. You know, if the king's not satisfied, off with your head. That's yes, the way things used to go, right? So what happened was, somebody's not muted, I think. But in any case, the, um, so what happened was, the, uh, they, he couldn't find anybody to make the throne. The only place in the world that agreed, that, 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 that offered to, to try to do it, were artisans in this little town called Shushan. And this little town, Shushan, was really a nothing. But these artisans, like of smaller towns, they didn't realize what was involved with, you know, the king and the politics behind it and what could happen to them if it doesn't please him. They weren't afraid to undertake this endeavor and they produced the throne. But there's one problem. The throne in ancient times could not be transported to the capital. All throughout the Persian Empire and the Babylonian Empire, the capital city of this empire was a city called Elam. It's mentioned in all previous works before this period. But now, what does Ahasuerus do? He has to have that throne. They told him, can't you just come for summer vacation and sit on the throne in Shushan? We'll make you a beautiful throne here, but not of that caliber. No, it has to be the throne. He changes the capital city, all the dignitaries, all the hotels, all the, the, the things to see in the city are now gonna be transferred to Shushan in order to accommodate the throne. Now, we find that that's incredible if you think about it, it's totally incredible that he accommodates the whole thing just to fit into Shushan. But we as Jews know that the reason why Shushan was chosen is because Shushan was where Mordechai and Esther lived and Hashem needed both of them for the whole story of Purim. And that's the entire reason why the whole capital city of the empire had to be moved. Unbelievable. Now today in modern Persia or Iran, the, it, they have a city there called Sus. 
And if there's a great book that came out, if any of you are interested in the historical things, this came out many years ago, but it's phenomenal scholarly work. Um, they have a whole picture here of the, the, uh, the probably the palace of Ahasuerus, the ruins of it in Sus, that the huge palace has been unearthed. Now they were very opulent, you know, in those days, like they were like the modern, the, 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 uh, the Italians of today, or, you know, some people say the Hungarians were like opulent like that. The Persians, even of today, it's all red and gold and everything magnificent. That's how he lived. And that's how he wanted to impress. So they moved the whole thing when he sat on his throne, which took three years. That's why mentions the three years. Then he was ready to make his party. And now he wants to do his final stage, which is pleasing the people. Let's reach out to the people that all love me. I'm giving them free phones, free cell phones. I'm giving them um, like in Toronto. Now they just offered they're going to be giving 100, uh, 200 black families will be given enough money to afford a house in Toronto. Wouldn't it be nice if they would do that for the Jewish families here in Toronto too, but they're doing it for the black families. But in any case, the um, you know, free university, that was a big talk of a talking point of a lot of people are always offering free this and free that in order to win over the populace when it's not a dictatorship. But in any case, he um, now, so we find that um, in the third verse, in the third verse, in the third year, he made a party now for all of his servants and ministers. So this is like all the government officials and, um, you know, the Chel Parasum Adai, all the, the top people of the, uh, you know, in, 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 in the Persian Medi in the Median kingdoms, the Partumim are the important people and, the, and already all the heads of state are all going to come to this party. In verse four, he, there are six adjectives used to describe the beautiful things in his palace. Osher, kavod, machuso, yakar, tiferes, gedula, so. Six adjectives. Why are the six adjectives employed? Because, says the Vilna Gon, or I'm not sure if it's the Yosef Lekach in this case, I think it is the Vilna Gon in this case, the 180-day um, party, what did he do with the 180-day party? He showed all of his treasures to all the people that attended the party. They got to see the national treasures of Koresh. Not only is he gonna give them a huge spread, but he's going to give them all, uh, uh, they can see all the treasures. Six treasures were revealed each day to, to, you know, to make them happy. So if you do the math, 180 days times six is 1,080. This is where he showed off the 1,080 things that Nebuchadnezzar had sunk. These were ancient things, you know, statues or whatever they were, probably out of copper, bronze, gold, all that kind of stuff that um, he had to show off to all these important dignitaries for 180 days. And then when the 180 day party ended, he decided to make a party just for the people in Shushan. And in Shushan, in the verse, it says, Mi gadol ad katan, every single schnook was invited to the party in Shushan. Now, why did he do that? Why did he, he had a reason, again, a people pleasing reason. His reason was that for that, who do you need the most to be behind you out of all your 127 countries? You need the people closest to you to be on your side because if God forbid someone attacks you, you have to be protected. You know, if you have everybody you're on your team in your city, they will come to your defense. So he decided to spoil now the populace of Shushan for seven days straight. Now they had, um, okay, so that, that's, that's what he basically did. So every single citizen is, and, and it said, it, we're, gonna, we're going to see in, um, in the, uh, how do you say, in, in verse five, it says he had, okay, it was in Chatzar Ginas Bisan Hamelach. Chatzar means courtyard of the king's palace, but Ginas Bisan is a certain kind of garden. There were so many people that attended, it spilled over until the, out, the garden that was outlying the courtyard. That's how many people attended this thing, tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of people. Verse six, now it talks about all these different beautiful 
uh, materials uh, that were used in built in in this uh, presentation that when they came to the palace, this is what they saw. Now we see they had, you know, um, it talks about even the floor had like precious jewels on it. So every little person, waiters and waitresses and busboys and everybody was trampling and all the precious stones because the king wanted them to feel you're on my team. I, I care about you. So therefore you'll care about me. And then look, they even gave verse seven, Apostle Zion, clay Zahav, they get out of, you know, uh, out of gold cups, they were all drinking and, you know, and all kinds of beautiful vessels. Some, this is where Rashi says it could be the vessels, the base of Migdash. And they gave tremendous amount of wa a wine to everybody to drink out of. Now, Pasach Ches is very interesting. We'll explore that in a little bit more detail. Pasach Ches says, Hashtia Kadas Ein Ones, which means, and drinking was according to the law, there was no coercion. What does this mean? Well, in ancient times, and maybe there's even an equivalent of it today, I don't know, there was a custom, if you were a man, you drank up a certain amount, you could down a certain amount and you'd, you'd be able to stand on your own two feet and you were a man. So in other words, they provided cups that had that amount in it that to show you were a man, if you wanna drink that amount that the average man is supposedly to be macho, has to drink, it was kadas but ain't no nace. Nobody forced you to drink that amount. You could drink that plus as much as you want. That's how they were giving it out. Um, I'll call Rav Beisol, Asoskirtson, Ish Beish, to do like every man's requirement. And you must remember from way back when we were children, and we're trying to get this Megillah, already you're seeing this is not the Megillah we knew as children. <laughs> this is already a, a different level of Megillah. This is worthy for adult reading and to understand this whole thing. Now, the... Um, when we say that they're doing kirtzon ish be ish, Rashi says, you know, they had kosher food there and Haman could eat there and Mordecai could eat there. And you know what, this, this is a second faux pas of the Jews. The Jews were not supposed to go to the party of Achishverosh. Um, Mordecai told them not to go. And I believe it was, I don't remember, I have to look it up. I think it's 1500 people or 1800. I'll, I'll look it up. I don't have it right on me right now. For some reason it's, uh, it's beyond me. But it was like a, a small percentage of the Jewish people did not listen to Achishverosh, but that was already, we're all Aravim Zel Lazer, we're all responsible for each other. And we were taken to task that we allowed all these people to go to the party of Achishverosh. They, they were also worried for political reasons. They felt such a big king. If we don't show up, what's it going to look like for the Jewish people? Now, today we do have organizations like Agudah Sisrol, and, and we have in Knesset, we have organizations that are you know, suppose that are supposed to represent the from uh, ideas. However, um, in those days, that was too much effort. Mordechai felt, first of all, the women and all that going on over there, it was not a place for a nice Jewish boy to be. So for that reason, they were, it was wrong for them to disobey Mordechai and attend this party. But there's another explanation of Kirtzon Ish Ve'ish, which is really incredible. Usually, you know, when there's a state banquet, I know all of us have been invited, but maybe somebody listening has been, so please let me know if you have been. I was told at least, and I know it works that way for let's say Shever Brachas or for a big event or for weddings, you are given one menu, maybe for those gluten-free, uh, this free, that free, other free, other kashrus concerns, there may be a few substitutions, maybe, but when there's a huge amount of people, a caterer cannot accommodate everyone. But what does Achishverosh do? This flies in the face of anything you could possibly make. This is so crazy to go to such an extent to please people. Kirtzon ish ish means one guy says, I want my eggs over easy. The other guy says, no, I want, you know, I want uh, scrambled. I want, I want, I want uh, soft boiled eggs. I want more garlic in my chicken. I want more basil in my chicken. I want more this one. To accommodate thousands, tens of thousands of people. This was Achashverosh. Unbelievable. Now we are supposed to, we are, B'nai Avram Yaakov, we're supposed to accommodate every Jew. We're supposed to give them the best that we have. Try to make, make them happy and eat what they want and not what they don't want. And try to see if they have any allergies or sensitivities to food that we shouldn't serve at our table. That's true. But we're talking about a huge amount of people here. And when you're having such an event, 
imagine when the caterers would go insane, running back and forth, hither and yonder. You could just picture like this one wants this and that, and the other, and, you know, and everybody gets exactly what they feel like eating at that moment. It's ridiculous, unbelievable. Plastic test, verse nine. Also, Vashti Hamalka made a party for women. Now, that's very, very interesting. Um, what we learned from this, there is something, there's a lesson behind all this. Now, why did she make a party? It's teaching us, first of all, in the olden days, women did not go to parties with men. Um, even if I, I was told by people in the early 20th century in Canada, and I would assume it's other places too, that there was a separate boys and girls entrance to school every morning, separate doors. And when you look at pictures, I remember I went to Pittsburgh, there was a museum there, I think it was by Heinz, if I'm not mistaken, had a, has a museum there. And in, it, it was showing like people on a street scene in the early 1900s. And you see everybody there, all the men are wearing jackets and, all, and hats and, uh, you know, fully dressed and, and women are fully dressed, you know, until recent times, or well, maybe ancient, it's like recent, but as we're becoming more civilized, we're becoming more like the ancients, like totally, you know, in states of undress of torn jeans and everything else all over the place and cut this and cut that everywhere. But people did, you know, have, a, women had a certain dignity and they wouldn't necessarily appear at all these dinners and, and parties and everything. They'd have this separate party. So Vashti made her own party. It didn't say Vashti decided to come along with the men. That was unheard of. But Mordecai still felt there would be sneeze issues even when, when a man's party. So that's why he didn't feel they should go there. That was one reason. He had, I'm sure, more reasons than that. But in any case, they, Vashti made a party. Why did she make a party? The reason is, is being that when she sees the king is getting very comfortable with himself and he's starting to feel like, I don't even need my wife. My wife might claim to fame, but all of a sudden she notices his attitude every day at, at the party goes on. He's becoming more and more sure in the throne of himself. He doesn't feel like he needs to be on Vashti's coattails, so to speak. And he feels he's, he's his own man. He's this great guy here. So what happens? He, uh, he starts feeling, you know, he doesn't even feel such a need for his wife at all. She decided I'm going to show him. And where does she make her party? Base Hamalchus. She makes it in the king's inner chamber. The king would have a room where he would contemplate. No one is allowed in that room, a royal room. Somebody said, Rebrevda, Sassal said that Hitler Yamachimo had a room like that. And it took 10 minutes to get to him in the room, to walk over to talk to him. It took you 10 minutes till you got to his part where he was sitting. You know, so this royal room, she was trying to show, look who's, I'm the royal person, not you in this family. And, um, and this is what I'm showing you. So she made, she made it in the royal room. He makes it in the courtyard. So she also made this party. Now, what's going on? The Midrashim tell us, you know, the, the rooms were not far from each other. There's a lot of women. And, you know, when women get together, we tend to talk. Uh, by the way, you know, it says there are 10 uh, packages of speech given to the world and nine were given to women. It doesn't mean that we talk more. I, that's my belief, at least. I've, I've heard an interpretation that women really have more modes of ex expression, empath empathy and cheerleading and all kinds of things are more common by women than by men. The women are more knowledgeable in how to use them than men are, you know? So for this reason, um, the, uh, the women in the time of the Megillah, you know, were talking of course, and, you know, expressing themselves and, and you know, empathy and sympathy and all the other things. I remember somebody once told me that she took a course in social work and six months of the course was spent in how to say phrases of empathy. Can you imagine? And like, you just repeat back what the person said to show you heard what he said and you're empathizing. So it's, it's, it's a chachma and women are more skilled in that than men. But women were talking and what happened according to, according to, the, to this parish, what happened was they hear the men, the men hear the women, and of course, what do men think about, especially now, you know, we're not talking about Torah scholars that are talking and learning all the time. They're talking about whatever. They hear women's voices and they all start talking about women. And everybody's having a whole discussion, which are the most beautiful women. 
Now, some people say, I wish they all could be California girls. You know, some people are saying this, that, and the other. But Ahasuerus says, I have the most beautiful Babylonians. That's the best model of all. So he's in a drunken stupor right now, just like a former mayor of Toronto. And when he's in his drunken stupor, he decides that he's going to get his wife to go on display, show everybody how beautiful Babylonian women are. So what happens is we find that um, he calls in verse 10, Pasuk Yud, he calls his seven advisors and um, he, he calls them, you know, that the, his seven um, people that always served him at all times could be like butlers or attendants, I guess we could call them. They said to bring Vashti Hamalka. Now, if you notice before in the previous verse, Vashti, throughout the whole Megillah, sometimes she's called Vashti Hamalka, which means Vashti the queen. Sometimes she's called Hamalka Vashti, the queen Vashti. Now, wh what's the difference? So the Vilna Gon says that when she's called Hamalka Vashti, we have to, he's, he's thinking in terms of politics and royalty. And when he's calling her Vashti Hamalka, she's a woman first and the queen second. And that's what she is in this verse. He wants to show her womanhood. And then he wants her, her uh, the, it, it, in other words, her royalty has been put down a, nit, a, a notch because right now he's so full of himself that all he has all these admirers. And she has to come, Pasigir Aleph, with the Kesser Malchus. That's all she was supposed to come in wearing to show everybody her beauty because she's beautiful looking. Now, verse, verse 12, Yudbeis Batima Ein Hamalka Vashi. She refused to come. Now, she refused to come. Why? They say Vashti would have been very happy to do so. Like she was, she was not a modest type of woman. But the thing was that Vashti that day broke out either in boils or some people say she had a tail, whatever it was, she didn't look good. It, wasn't, it was not a bad hair day. It was a bad body day. So she didn't want to come out at all. So she refused. Now, according to the parish, she says here two things to the king. She says, you tell the king two messages. Number one, my father, my father could hold his wine. He could drink a thousand toasts to people and never show his wine and never get drunk. And you are a simple stable boy. That's the first message. Message number two, I refuse to come. And she didn't say why, but... Uh, <laughs> That was her own private little thing. So it says, by itself, Hamelech Ma'od Bahamaso Ba'arabo in Pasuk Yabes. The Melech, the king was very angry and his anger burned inside him. Now, why that seems repetitive in verse 12? Why does it say he was angry and his anger burnt inside him? Because there were two things to be angry about. One, she insulted him and called him a stable boy. And the second thing was that, that, um, that, what's it called? That uh, she refused, right? Those are the two things he was angry about. So about the refusal, that he's going to, that's going to be mentioned, you know. So he, he told, he was very upset. He's going to tell his ministers in the next verse, um, he's going to be telling them, why does she refuse to come to me? He doesn't mention she called him a staple boy. So the part that he was able to get out of his system, in other words, he spoke it out with somebody, Person has to know when they're angry, it doesn't just go away. They have to do something, either change location, go out, take a drink, think about something else, try to change your mind with something. If you have to, with something really offensive, you can share it without lush and hard to another person. That's the best way to go for some people. But this one part about the stable boy, he had no way to, to get it out of himself. He had no way to get it out. So that was Barabo, he was fuming. Now, we as Jews do not believe, you know, there was this short, I don't know if it's still out there in psychology today. Anybody in the psychological field could get back to me on this one later. I would appreciate it. And the, there was once a point where you could vent. It was very important to vent your anger, like go in a punching bag or whatever it was to vent your anger. Um, that was popular in psychology at one point. We as Jews don't believe that. You could speak about it because we believe ha'adam nifal kafi pu'ulo sav person goes according to his actions. Actions become part of your persona. That's what we believe. We believe, Victor Miller says it a beautiful way, that a Jew should be a big hypocrite. 
for the good, not for the bad. You feel like getting angry. Instead, you speak in a whisper. You're really fuming inside. That is going to eventually have it that you will not act out of anger if you act the part. You feel miserable, but you dry your tears and you get up and greet somebody. That eventually will get rid of your depression. You know, person acts like they say for depression, the, one of the best things they say is keep the person busy because the first thing a person depressed wants to do is not do anything, you know? So in all these cases, we believe you're supposed to act, keep going, act in a proper, proper manner, and that will eventually influence your psyche. But you do sometimes something is really huge. You're allowed to vent if something's really huge to you should try to change names or people or a small uh, detail so the person won't guess who it is. If you can, if you can't, you have to say who it is. Uh, for a few people, you can't vent to the whole world. That's already too much. You're not allowed to vent that much. You're not allowed. But um, in any case, that's why he exploded because he could never tell anybody that, that was the main thing that was bothering him. Now, we find in Pusik Yadalad, somebody appears on the scene. I usually would ask doing a question format, but I'm not doing it today because we have to fit a lot in. Memuchan, that was Haman, because he was Muchan, he was preparing himself for his uh, ultimate downfall. He was a former barber, and he became, uh, you know, he became the one of the, the uh, advisors to the king. That day, the other person was retired from the job, and Haman came into power that day, and he was going to be one of the advisors as to what to do with Vashti. The um, because they want they want, if you look at Pusik Tezvav, the 15th verse, Mala Sospa Malka Vashti, what to do the Queen Vashti. In other words, she's a royal, like Achish Farish did not want to kill Vashti. He wanted to know how can we change things politically to get her out of this, you know, like like how can we avoid put how can we get her not to rebel, but at the same time to avoid death. So he's asking people. They were called Yode Das Vadin. These were people that knew the times. They knew politics. They knew how to behave under different circumstances, how to fix this one. You know, like, like Teddy Kennedy and Chappaquiddick, you know, how do we get out of this one, you know? And meanwhile, let her die in the meantime. But in any case, the, um, he wanted to keep the royal connection, but what do we do in this case? Because she does not listen to the king's edicts. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Now, Think right now, the two people leading the world is a stable boy and a barber. And that's not so hard to imagine. The Canadian prime minister was a drama teacher, right? <laughs> and we find that Obama was, was, yes, a congressman, but before that he was like, uh, worked in a gift shop, I believe somewhere, I don't know, for many years. So, you know, <laughs> okay, Pusik Tezayan. So Mamukhan gets up there and he says, he says before the king, it's not only the king that Vashti wants to do it to, but she's going to make everybody rebel against authority. So really what he was based on, I'm going to just paraphrase a little bit of this because I do want to finish most of this chapter. So what happens is his proposal is the following, according to Gomi Vilna. He says that Haman gets up, if you notice, this is in um, Mamuchan, gets up, Tessayan. This is very unusual. Usually a junior senator, a junior congressman, your first day on the job, you don't get up and open your mouth. You first see how other people in government speak and you get the drift and then you open your mouth. First day on the job, it shows how much of a chutzpah Haman had. He gets up on the job and he says, this is not just the king, this is something else. Let's explain what he was suggesting. In those days, until this moment, the rule was that a king had total autonomy over everybody and everything, except the only exception to the rule was, at least in the Persian empire, was in dealing with personal matters, he had to appear before a court. He had to have legal advice. Something personal could be judged, but something governmental was, he was total autonomous. King is the boss, except for something personal, then you can have the leaders weigh in and decide as well. Now, what happens is the, um, so what happened was, the question was, is Vashti a communal matter? Is she a national concern or international? Or is she just a personal queen to the king? And then we have to judge it with the entire 
you know, board of directors with all the, the other leaders, the, the, the lawyers, the judges, all those, do they have to come in at this point? So the, um, so his suggestion was, Haman says, by a king, there is nothing that's personal. Did you hear that, Bill Clinton? Anyways, the, by a king, there is nothing personal. Everything is affects government that a king does. Therefore, a king is liable, is, has autonomy, has total power to do everything. So what they said was that, um, that they came out with the fact that since Vashi didn't listen, she, she, you know, she should not be queen anymore. It should be given to someone better than her. And, um, and from now on, he adds on another thing, how many tax on a rule. Apparently his wife was, he was an Amaleki. He was from Amalek and his wife was not. So he wanted her to listen to him under any circumstances. He wanted her to learn his language. So it said that, that men have total control in their households. That was a personal selfish thing that he did. And he had that executed as well. So that's the message that Haman wanted them to learn. And um, they said that Vashti will never be seen again. What that means is some, there are a few Mephorshim that say she was banished to a tower, but most Mephorshim said like she was never seen again for other reasons. And um, now what happens is the king has total autonomy. This rule that Haman instituted is going to be the ultimate rule that, that Haman suffers from. He's going to be the first person that's put to death because the king feels like it. And it's incredible that all the judges and all the rulers and advisors agreed to give the king total autonomy because now their lives are going to be in danger from now on. That they agreed to this is no less than incredible. So we've seen several incredible miracles in this first chapter, and I don't want to keep you any longer, but let's just review very quickly. And that's it. First of all, the whole incredible thing, how he got the treasures, how it went all the way from the Vukhat Netzer to him how to please people, he went to such an extent that they ended up in Shushan. And then, you know, to, to, to the every, that he, now he set himself up with a rule that the king has total power to put to death anybody is an incredible rule in ancient Persia that's unbelievably incredible. And that um, Mordechai and Esther are going to be big in this whole thing. And we see also, we're supposed to learn, especially as we prepare our Shalak Manas, the dangers of people pleasing how dangerous it is to just worry about that. This is an Ahasuerus thing, not an Esther and Mordechai thing. And that's on Purim day when it's all material things that we're dealing with. We have to remember not to lose sight of people pleasing should not be on our list of concerns because that is really engaging in Ahasuerus like behavior. But think about this government background is so similar to what we're living through today. This is the Megillah for Gullis because this is what, one of the things we're living today. Next week, we will probably do chapters two and three. I thank you for listening. I thank Ellie Sheva Shields for her phenomenal work. And I hope we can turn off the recording and people can unmute themselves.